this isn't a, a side doctrine. This isn't Acts 9, Acts 11, Acts 13. This isn't, did Adam and Eve have a belly button? This isn't minutia. Okay, this is fundamental, sound doctrine. If it's fundamental, then we need to know it. And I, I submit that it absolutely is fundamental. We need to know it. Just like a prosecuting attorney is going to build his case for the judge and for the jury, and he's going to make his points, so too I think that we can show with Scripture that our condition in Adam is dead in sin. So this is an essential doctrine. And if you understand Adam's rap sheet, who here has ever seen the book War and Peace? Or seen the book... Yeah, I say seen because I know... Less than 1% of the population has probably ever read it. I've never read it. But it's a really thick book. Or who's ever uh, seen the book uh, Gone with the Wind? Well, I didn't happen to bring one with me. And frankly, my dear, I didn't bring a copy. So... But it's a thick book. It's got a lot of words, right? Adam's rap sheet was not that big. Adam's rap sheet, you could fit on a tiny little piece of paper that big, and it said he disobeyed God. Just one little thing is all it took to, to propel the whole human race into a sinful state, a sinful nature. So what happens if we get our condition in Adam wrong? What happens if we don't understand that we're sinners by nature, on our way to hell, dead in trespasses and sins, what happens if we don't get that right? What happens if we don't understand the condition that we're in? Well, imagine this building that we're in. This uh, building came from an architect, had blueprints. What happens if the blueprints were wrong? What happens if the doors were up there and the windows were on the floor? Is that going to be a building that we can use? Is that going to be right? What about schematics for a vehicle? What if the wheels were on the roof? What if the steering wheel was behind you and the front was that way? It doesn't work. It's the same with the Bible. And what I mean by that is this. B-I-B-L-E. That's an acronym. Anybody want to take a guess at what B-I-B-L-E might stand for? I heard it. Basic instructions before leaving earth. That's what the Bible is. We don't know everything. He hasn't revealed everything to us. But what he has revealed is essential for what we need to know to make it through this life. Basic instructions before leaving earth. What happens if we get these instructions wrong? So, when Adam sinned, imagine this. This is pretty clean white. We're just going to say it's blank. When God made Adam, was there sin in Adam? No, there was not. He had complete fellowship with God. He walked in righteousness. There was no sin stain on him. There was nothing guilty. There was nothing that God could accuse him for. But then... Then you, get, then you got that little act of disobedience right there. We'll just, we'll just call that sin. And we can look at it as a dot, but what really happened, if, if this is Adam, my little stick figure guy, it tainted everything. It's completely in sin. It wasn't just one little act. His whole condition was one of sin. And another way we can look at that is like this. If you've probably seen it, if you've got a cliff here and a cliff here, here's man's righteousness. It only gets you so far. You can never cross that gap to righteousness through your own works. It's only through the cross that we can cross that gap. Man's righteousness falls short. So one of the things that we're talking about being dead in trespasses and sins is that we find that this is an issue that has been going on before the dispensation of grace even began. 
It's something what you might call a trans-dispensational truth. Other trans-dispensational truths are something like death and taxes, right? doesn't matter what administration you've been in. Death and taxes are trans-dispensational truth, right? They were taxed back in Caesar's day. <laughs> and that was pre-dispensation uh, of grace. But my point is, is there are things that are true throughout God's word that are true no matter what dispensation you're in. And guess what? Sin's one of them. God is a God of love. Transdispensational truth. God is a jealous God over his glory and over his creation. And since Adam's fall, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If we're looking back here after Adam sinned, guess what? Sinner. Abraham. Sinner. Moses. Sinner. You get the, you get the point. It didn't matter what dispensation we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here's another one. And we learned this back from the very beginning. You learned so much from the beginning. Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. So when Adam and Eve sinned and they knew that something had gone wrong and they felt the shame within them and tried to cover themselves up, God said, that's not good enough. That's not what's going to cover it. Without the shedding of blood... Is no remission of sin. So the first sacrifice was when God had killed an animal and put the coat on them. Here's another one. Without faith, it's what? Impossible. Mission impossible without faith, try to please God. That is mission impossible, okay? So we see that sin is a transdispensational principle with the trans-dispensational problem. And what does sin do? Sin brings death. And what is death? When God said, and let's look at Genesis chapter 2 real quick. I believe it's 16 and 17. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eat thereof thou shalt surely die. Die. What did Adam know about death? There was no experience that he knew. There was nothing that he saw in creation that would give him this idea of what death was. But I'm sure... God had to explain it to him because we see what it is now. Death is separation. The physical death is the soul from the body. The spiritual death is your soul from God. So man's problem is sin. If you go to a mechanic and you know that there's something wrong with your alternator or you know there's something wrong with your transmission and you take that vehicle in and the mechanic says, oh, it looks like you got a flat tire there, that's, that's your problem. What? Are you kidding me? That's not the problem. Are you going to go to that mechanic again? If you go to a doctor and you know you've got, a, you've got something going wrong with your elbow, and he says, well, it's clearly something wrong with your big toe. Are you, are you serious? Are you going to go to that doctor again? Are you going to go... The transition here is, nor should you go to someone who's not going to tell you what your condition is as a sinner. Unbelief has a problem that separates man from God, else why would they be separated? So what I'm after is, is a proper diagnosis. We want our car mechanics to give us a proper diagnosis. We want doctors to give us proper diagnosis. Why should it be any different with pastors, teachers, and ministries? So how did we get here? If you're in Genesis 2, let's go on to Genesis 3 here. Genesis chapter 3, verses, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. He didn't say that. Lest ye die. 
And the serpent said unto the woman, here's the big lie, you shall not surely die, complete contradiction on God's word. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant, she's looking it over, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, he was standing by, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened. That's how, and you can look at Romans 5.12 real quick if you want to go there with me. Romans 5.12 is kind of a commentary on what just happened. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So sin brings death. That's why we die. I've got a little bit of indigestion this morning. Sin's giving me indigestion. That is literally true. I have indigestion. We have problems with our body. We get frail. We have aches and pains. Romans 8 says we groan within ourselves. And the reason we groan is because we're ready to be rid of this. We groan. Creation groans. And groans because of sin. And we see then that we're not sinners because we sin. Adam was. But before that he wasn't a sinner. But now everybody after him, rather we sin because we're sinners. And the difference is actually important. Because it talks about the fundamental nature of who we are in Adam. Sin makes us depraved or corrupt. And I don't mean that in a partial way. I mean that in a total way. But what I mean by that is total depravity doesn't mean that man is a slave to every sin or that by practice he's the worst sinner possible or that he has no conscience. We know a lot of upstanding people in society that do a lot of good things. And those are good things to do. Good works are for men that we may, as uh, the Bible says, the goodness of God leads to repentance. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't do good things but good things will never be enough to cross that gap from unrighteous to righteous so it's evident from everyday observation that unsafe people are capable of many acts of decency and honesty philanthropy and goodwill the natural man is capable of being highly religious do you remember the first sacrifice that was brought that we read about in scripture that Cain and Abel brought Cain brought a sacrifice he just brought the wrong one. He brought what he wanted to bring, not what God asked. That is religion. So, the natural man is capable of being highly religious and of curtailing fleshly appetites, even closely imitating the Christian life so as to deceive the most discerning. But Christianity is not merely morality. You know, there's a lot of people that say, well, I'm a Christian. I was born in America. What? Have you read the Bible? That's not how you become a believer. But they think in terms of that, good works, bad works. My good outweighs my bad. I'm a pretty good guy. That's not what the Bible means when it says we're totally depraved. God made man in his image prior to... Prior to Adam's sin, God made man in his image. And then what happened after Adam sinned? Then he begat children in whose likeness? His likeness. That's why every person after Adam is born dead in sin. Let's look at Psalms 51. Psalm 51 verse 5. This is a psalm of David. He says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Shapen, formed, molded. That is the condition that we find ourselves in when we're born. We're born in iniquity. 
as a state, as a nature. Sin, unfortunately, is the inheritance you don't want. Right? It's not like winning the lottery and, yes! No, you don't want that one. At all. I wish, you know, you could be like, no, no thanks. It doesn't work that way. We didn't get the choice after Adam to be born not in sin. You had no choice in the matter. But contrast that to the inheritance that we have in Christ, and you do have a choice in that matter. The uh, inheritance that we have in Christ is eternal life and righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's a choice you can make and absolutely should make if you haven't. And once sin entered into the world, and sin entered into the world and death by sin, Sin takes each person captive. It literally holds the ransom. Sin is the separation, right? It's disobedience. And we'll cover some definitions here in a minute. But it holds you ransom. And once you're saved, sin doesn't hold that ransom anymore. You become bought out of the slave market of sin when you become saved. When you trust Christ as your Savior. Let's look at John 8, 34. I'll read 33. They answered him, We, Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Last night, I believe it was Brother Jordan who talked about uh, the servant was a slave. Whosoever commits sin is a slave to sin. You can't get away from it of your own. Now let's look at Romans 6.16. Now look, what we just read in John 8, 34, that's a transdispensational principle. Amen. Whosoever commits sin is a slave to sin. Romans 6, 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, that's what sin brings, or, or of obedience unto righteousness. So, what, Adam, what happened in Adam is that he brought the whole world in slavery unto sin. And that's the condition that every unbeliever finds themselves in. Amen. Let's look at 2 Timothy 2.11. And the reason why I'm going through a lot of these verses is I really want you to see the full understanding of the human condition prior to salvation. We want to get a proper diagnosis of either our past if we're saved or our present if we're not. And like Greg talked about last night, never wants to make the assumption that everybody in the room is saved. That's a good thing to do, to not make that assumption. 2 Timothy 2.11 says, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And one of the reasons why I wanted to bring that up is because, yes, we're dead in trespasses and sins, but what does it say here? If we be dead with him. How do you get to be dead with Christ? Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So even though Adam, when he fell, when he sinned and disobeyed, was he dead with Christ? No. Even though he's in a status of deadness, death, separation, death itself, when it says here, for if we be dead with him, that's an identification. Just like when we understand the word baptism doesn't always mean by water, it's identification. So we need to be dead with him, identified with Christ. And you do that when you trust Christ as your Savior, then you become crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. <laughs> 
Who here has ever seen the movie The Lion King? I think a lot of people have. And part of that movie, well, there's several characters. You've got the, the mean Scar, you've got Simba, Pride Rock, you know, and if you uh, remember from the movie at all, Scar had killed the king and blamed it on Simba. Simba ran away, and he's thinking about coming back. But Simba's conflicted because if he goes back, he'd have to face his past. And you remember that old baboon Rafiki? Hits him on the head. And Simba goes, ah, ah, that hurt. My wife told me not to do this. And I don't know if I should do it or not. <laughs> Greg did his last night, so I'm going to do it too. Now, now, I will say, I, I did get permission before I said it. So <laughs> this is on you. Rafiki says, it doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> But that's, you know, I like to look at things like that from a spiritual perspective. And I think we can, the more you grow in the knowledge of God's Word and let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, the more you can look at things outside and internalize those and find a spiritual application so that you can take that out into the world and reach people with it. Amen. But my point is, the past hurts. Right? We talk about, oh, I've got indigestion or my knee hurts or... I got pain somewhere, and we die. We die because of sin. So what is sin? I found at least three things in Scripture that identify at its most basic form what sin is. We think about it sometimes in abstract terms as just maybe something we do or you know disobedience, but what at its most basic form, what is sin? Well, turn with me to 1 John 3, 4. And that's why I wanted to talk about the transdispensational truth. Because there are several Bible writers that get to the heart of the matter of what sin is. First John chapter 3, verse 4 says... Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth. I have a hard time saying that word. I had a hard time saying it last night. Transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And in that context, I believe you'll find that he's talking about the law of Moses. And if you look at James 2.10, you don't have to turn there, but whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in how many points? One. One point guilty of the whole law. How many points did Adam offended. One. one. Just one. One little thing. But was Adam under the law of Moses? Well, hold on a second. Whosoever commits sin transgresses all the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. What law was it that sin that Adam had disobeyed? Well let's keep reading. Let's go to first John five seventeen. If you're in first John chapter three, let's go over to the right or the east. <laughs> As uh, Brother Richard Jordan said, 1 John 5, 17. Look here. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not of the dead. All unrighteousness is sin. So, transgression of the law is sin. Now all of a sudden, all unrighteousness is sin. Look at, uh, look at uh, Romans 1, 28 with me. Romans 1, verse 28 through 32. This will give us a, a fuller idea of what unrighteousness entails. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate, corrupt mind to do those things which are not convenient, not good for them. Being filled with all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, deceitful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Man, it's a long list. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. All unrighteousness is sin. Now let's look at Romans 14, 23. 
here in chapter 1 there. Just go right a few pages. 14.23. He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eats not of what? Faith. For what so this is a this is an unqualified statement. Doesn't matter that Paul's talking about food here unnecessarily. For whatsoever is not of faith is what? Sin. Not of faith. What's the opposite of faith? Unbelief. Un distrust. Doubt. Whatever is not of faith is sin. So it's a fundamental principle going all the way back to the beginning that unbelief is a sin. Unbelief hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? He didn't believe what God said he was going to do. And time after time, unbelief hardened his heart. It was for unbelief the Jews wanted Jesus crucified. Have you ever thought about this? That the reason Lucifer sinned and wanted to be like God was because he didn't believe that God was the only God. His unbelief. He wanted to establish himself as God. When you talk to people and they don't believe the warnings that we show them from Scripture, that if they're not saved, they're a heartbeat away from hell. They don't believe the warning because they don't believe God. So we've seen how sin entered into the world through one man, and we've seen what God calls sin. Transgression of the law, unrighteousness, whatsoever is not of faith. Now, how many does that apply to? Romans 3.23 covers it. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin, as I understand it, comes from an archery term. Right? My son knows this. If you have an archery target, and there it is, bullseye would be righteousness. Here's Adam. Here's us, way over here. We're... We're so far wide of the mark, we're not even on target. That's, that's man's righteousness over here. That's what sin is. It's missing the mark. And we've all done it. Is it possible to hide your sin from God? That's kind of a, kind of a tricky question. Because as an unbeliever, no, it's not. Uh, Psalm 69.5, David says, O God, Thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from Thee. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows everyone's sins. But if you're saved and had the payment applied to your account, your sins are washed clean. You went from a crimson stain to white as snow. Sins are gone. So what is the present condition for unbelievers or your past prior to salvation? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 But the natural man, the natural, the person in Adam, receives not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man, dead in sin, cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Do you know what it is when you become saved that helps you to understand spiritual things? It's the Holy Spirit. The unbeliever doesn't have that. John 8.34 you want to turn there with me, John 8, 34. We've looked at that before. Jesus answered them, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Right? So the natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit. <clears throat> Whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. Now let's look at Romans 6.20. And I love this contrast here. This contrast tells us a big thing. Romans 6.20. See, we like using contrast. 
Because that's what this chart shows, right? That's what we understand through the dispensation of grace is that God is doing something now that He wasn't doing here. The contrast. And that's why contrasts are important. Understanding what's going on. Romans 6, 20-22. For when ye were the servants of sin, the slaves of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Servant of sin... You were free from righteousness. There was no righteousness that you could do that God would accept. You were free from it. <clears throat> what fruit had ye then in those things were of your now a shame? So when Paul's talking, he's talking to the Romans here. Those things you used to do when you were free from righteousness, now you're ashamed of. What fruit did you have in those things? For, in the, for the end of those things is what? Death. But now, see the contrast? But now being made free from sin and become servants to God and you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So if you're in sin, you're free from righteousness. When you become saved, you have Christ's righteousness applied to you and now you're free from sin. Isn't that what Paul tells us? There is no in-between. There is no, well, I'm unrighteousness, but I'm kind of good. I don't. I have a blank slate. What? That doesn't make any sense. I don't find that in Scripture. You're either a slave to sin and free from righteousness, or you're free from sin and a slave to righteousness. Amen. Now let's look at Ephesians 2. Let's go back there. The, the verse we started off with, we're finally back there. Ephesians 2, 1. Paul is talking to the saints at Ephesus and he says and you saint hath he Christ quickened, made alive made alive because you were dead in trespassing and sins Look, it says right there, who were dead in trespassing and sins wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of who? disobedience is sin among whom also we all had our conversation in time past. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by what? Nature. By nature. We sin because we're sinners. Amen. We're by nature the children of what? Sin. Wrath. We're ch uh, and we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. When you're in unbelief, when you're a sinner without Christ's righteousness applied to you, you are in nature, you are by nature the child of wrath. But God, here's another contrast. I know this is kind of like the bad news sermon, but guess what? I'm going to leave with a little bit of good news. But God, who is rich in mercy for his what love? Great love. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were what? Dead in trespasses and sins, check this out, quickened us together. How? By grace you are saved. It's there in parentheses. How did you get quickened? By grace through faith. <clears throat> and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Let's look at something else. Let's uh, go over a couple chapters to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. Paul says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being what from the life of God? Alienated. Alienated. Because sin does what? Sin does what to you? Separate. It separates you from God. No. It's, not an, it's not like, oh, mind blown thing that when Adam sinned, he became separated. And that's what we find in Ephesians 4 that what does it say? Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Romans 3.10 is a memory verse that my boys uh, learned the other day at Bible camp. As it is written, there's none righteous. No, not one. Another one, Romans 2.5. Here's another thing. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. When I told you that does God remember your sin? He absolutely will. 
and, he, and for the unbeliever, they're treasuring up that until the day of wrath. They're just building their account. Romans 8, 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. There is nothing in our sin in our sin state of unrighteousness that we can be subject to the law of God because there's nothing we can do to please God. We reside in unbelief. Without what? It's impossible to please God. Without faith. Let's look at John 3.18. I'll read verse 17 too. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, that wasn't his point. But that the world through him might be what? Might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned. Because he that believes on him is transferred from death unto life. But he that believes not is what already? Condemned already because he hath not what? Believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now let's look at Romans 8.1. Here's a contrast. Romans 8.1 So if you believe, you're not condemned. If you don't believe, you're condemned already. Romans 8.1 bears this out. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in who? In Christ. What does the opposite of that mean? If just what like we read from John 3.18, if you're not in faith, you're condemned already. Amen. Only those who are in Christ have no condemnation. Amen. Amen. So to kind of wrap this up, the spiritual blessings that we have, such as forgiveness and justification and reconciliation, eternal life, peace with God, are found only in who? Christ. Christ. All that are in Christ are made alive. And Adam all what? Because of sin. So there are two main groups, classifications of people. The declared righteous had Christ's righteousness imputed to them or the unrighteous. There's no other category. So to recap and to summarize, unbelievers, found in Adam, either our past if we're saved or our present if we're not. We are dead in trespasses and sins, alienated from the life of God, condemned, servants or the slaves of sin, free from righteousness, we're guilty, faithless, not pleasing God, in the natural carnal man, which is enmity against God, we are shaped in iniquity, we're not righteous, we're unjust, we're unregenerate, this is a long list. Children of wrath. That's why what, that's what I wanted to show the whole of Scripture. Because it just dovetails in this transitional truth that man's problem is sin and that Christ is the solution. Amen. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Amen. Lord. You know, John Newton, anybody know a little bit of history knows that John Newton wrote the song Amazing Grace. And he lived a life of sin like all of us do prior to salvation. He understood his sinfulness. I'll put it that way. And when he come to that realization of how his sin was going to send him to hell. He cried out to God. And afterwards he wrote this. And I think we can understand this to be true to an extent. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. Because we're still in this body of sin. I am not what I hope to be in another world. We haven't yet received the glory which shall be revealed in us in Christ yet. We're still in this mortal body. But he says, but I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he says something else too that I've always really liked. He says, although my memory is fading, 
I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, but Christ is a great Savior. And he wrote Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. So if you're an Adam, you better get out of him as quick as you can and find Christ and trust in his work that he did for you on the cross. And when you understand that that gospel message that we have today is not found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You understand the dispensation of grace and all the things that we have freely been given through Christ. I hope that you'll see that. Let us pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the great physician and you give us the most accurate, proper diagnosis of our condition in Adam. We thank you for that because you've also given us the solution, which is Christ. We thank you, Lord, so much for your word. We thank you for this time around it today. And we thank you for all that Christ has done for us. And in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.